So I'm not too sure if it's because you got an extra hour of sleep or because of the election, but it's great to have you here. And no doubt, this week, as you know, is our national election. And emotions are running high, right? About the candidates, about their platforms, about the outcome. This week, you will get to have your say if you're over 18 and registered through your vote. You'll get to have your say about the election. But before you vote, I want you to do one thing. Pray. That's what this whole message is going to be about. In fact, when dealing with the election and its results, prayer is the first, the last, and the best resource you have. But the question is, pray for who? Pray to who? And pray for what? I'd like to answer those critical questions about prayer from a personal letter written from one leader to a very young pastor who was overseeing one of the largest churches in the New Testament. And he was facing similar situations that we are facing today. The letter is from Paul the Apostle, and it is written to Timothy, the young pastor of the church in Ephesus. Now, for you to understand a little about Ephesus, uh, a city that we don't know much about today, uh, but Ephesus, back in the New Testament day when Paul was writing, uh, there's a debate about whether it was the third largest or fourth largest city in the Roman Empire. It housed 250,000 people. They had an auditorium that would rival uh, any uh, sports stadium uh, that is high school or college in New England. I can't say in Texas because they have like 150,000 seaters, which is crazy for high school. But they had a 24,000 seater auditorium. If you're a Christian and you uh, have read Acts, you know what happened in that auditorium. Because of the preaching of the gospel in Ephesus, a lot of people became Christians, so much so that the, Nash, the uh, pastime trade of the city, which is the making of little idols to the goddess Diana, uh, fell into disrepair and people were losing money. So they stirred up the whole city. The whole city grabbed two of Paul's uh, uh, partners, dragged them into this stadium, and they started r causing a riot. And Paul, who was outside the stadium, begged to be led in to go and speak to them. And then the riot, because of a wise person, he said, if this is from God, it's going to, you can't stop it. If it's not from God, it's just going to disappear, kind of quelled the crowd. But imagine that, 24,000 people chanting for your death. And Paul goes, I want to get into that stadium to talk to them. That's Ephesus. It housed one of the seven ancient wonders of the uh, um, ancient world the temple to Diana, massive temple that people from all over the Roman Empire would travel to to find out uh, answers to their prayers. They would find out answers to their travels. Uh, they would try to find out answers to their life's problems. In fact, they believed Diana could save them. Not only that, they, in Ephesus, there were, um, there were plenty of other religions uh, in operation, not just the temple of Diana, but uh, religions to all manner of gods and goddesses. And in the midst of this environment, in a massive port that was a trade port for the Roman Empire, where citizens lived who believed that Caesar was, uh, was a son of God and was divine, that is where Timothy is pastoring his church and trying to grow them. And in the midst of this environment, Paul writes a critical letter to him, and he opens his letter uh, in the second chapter of 1 Timothy with these words. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. All people. You see, here's what was happening in the Ephesian church. The people believed that only certain people could be Christians, and only certain people could be saved. And so they chose to only pray for those people. In fact, most of them believed it was only Jewish people who could be saved. So they didn't pray for the Gentiles. They engaged in exclusivistic praying. And Paul says to Timothy, you need to teach the congregation that God wants everybody to be saved, so you pray for all people. That's how he starts. And then he makes a revolutionary statement for Timothy. 
pray also for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Pray for the emperor who is persecuting you. Pray for the emperor who people think is God. Pray for the kings and local officials who might be hampering you. Pray for those people who might be opposed to your way of life. Pray that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, he writes. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed, Paul is writing, as a herald and an apostle, I'm telling the truth and I'm not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. It's an interesting passage, and we're going to unpack that a little to look at this concept, because the first instruction Timothy gives is to pray. And so when dealing with the election and its results, prayer is our first, last, and best resource. So who do we pray for? Well, Paul is pretty explicit. All people, not some people, not the people you like, not the people you, uh, you uh, enjoy getting along with, not the people who have the same opinion as you. You pray for all people. Pray for leaders. Pray for those in authority. Pray for the, the political leaders. Pray for all in authority. That's who we pray for. It's an interesting concept of why Paul is asking us to pray for all these people and all leaders. And he has very explicit reasons in the passage uh, for why we should pray that way. This is from the NIV application commentary from Walter Leafried writes, The purpose of this passage is to encourage prayer for an orderly society in which the gospel will be able to reach everyone. The point of this passage is not actually prayer. Prayer is the context of the passage. Salvation is the content of the passage. Paul is saying, if you want to be able to spread the gospel, if you want to grow the kingdom, if you want to share that Jesus is Lord, pray for an orderly society. That's the concept of the word peaceful and quiet lives. Because when there is peace in society, when there are quiet when people are living quietly, you are able to share the gospel in a powerful way. That's the purpose of the passage, to encourage prayer for an orderly society. So that's one reason why we pray, for an orderly society. And that's one reason why we pray for our leaders, so that they would create an orderly society, that Walter Leefield continues. The implication is that as the world sees the Christian character of believers, because he talks about that we might live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness, the implication is that the world sees the Christian character of believers, and that when they see the Christian character of believers, not only will the gospel go forward in an orderly, peaceful society, but also it will be recognized as genuine. So I'm going to ask you to do something incredibly hard right now, while I preach. I'm going to ask you to not think of that person. I don't care who that person is. The person on your social feed who's annoying you, the person who has that other opinion. What I'm going to ask you to do is think about yourself. Now, this message is specific to Christians. If you're not a believer of Christ, I'm going to ask you to consider this as an invitation to think about the Jesus we're talking about and what He wants in us. But if you're a Christian, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is my character helping the gospel move forward? Is my character, the way I speak, the way I act, the way I interact with others, is it going to show that the gospel that we talk about the good news that Jesus came to save all people and reconcile them back to God so that all people would have that eternal relationship with God. Is my character proving that as genuine or is it proving it as the opposite? Again, resist thinking about that person 
let's hold a mirror up in front of ourselves. I had to send a message uh, this week to a couple of friends of mine. We engage in uh, lengthy political debates, and usually it's, it's explorative. We're trying to understand each other's positions. But the closer the election has come, the less explorative and the, a lot more vitriolic those conversations have become. And eventually I sent a message to them saying, listen, what is the purpose of our conversations? Because if it's vitriolism, which I've contributed to in the last few conversations we've had, one, I'm sorry for that, but two, I don't want that anymore. If it's exploratory, let's have those conversations, but I'm not interested in vitriol and debate and demeaning and dehumanizing of different people. Uh, I'll let you know how that conversation goes. I haven't had a response yet. <laughs> um, but this is the idea, is that I'm trying to present that my character would hold the gospel up as a higher value than the winning of a political party. Which is hard to say in this day and age. On both sides, people are feeling very passionate about their positions. But Paul is saying, to a society where there was no democracy, no vote, the emperor was considered a divine, pray for that person so that we could have a peaceful and quiet life and living godliness and, and, and holiness. And if you pray that way, he says, it pleases God. Isn't that the end purpose of why we exist? To please God? And here Paul is saying, here's one way you can do that through your prayers. Walter Liefeld carries on with this. We're not merely to pray for the gospel or for God's power on behalf of the preacher and witness, which is what Paul is asking, but for the very officials whose decisions can affect the environment in which the gospel is to operate. We know historically that in uh, environments where Christianity is opposed and uh, banned, it still grows and fosters. But we also know historically that in societies where there's order and peace, Christianity prospers and grows even more. So pray for the growth of Christianity. One last, uh, one final comment from Walter Liefeld. Prayer, he argues, is the normal, and one may conclude, a major part of the church's spiritual ministry. It's not just good for the election. As a church, a major component of our job as a gathered community of people is to pray for the world in which we live. So when you gather in small groups, when we gather in our ministry teams, when we gather on Sunday morning at the back to pray before the service, we spend time praying for the world. That's why in our service we have that section called prayers for the world. We want to pray for what is happening because that is what God has called us to do as followers of Christ. Take a moment do a quick mental assessment. Rate yourself between 1 and 10, just picking random numbers here. How much are you praying for the, the world? How much are you praying for the gospel to be advanced? Consider that and think about that for a moment. But remember that praying for someone doesn't mean praying to someone. Paul makes that great distinction, pray for the emperor, but you don't pray to the emperor. So who do we pray to? Easy answer. What's the answer? Just yell it out. God. But which type of God do you pray to? Jesus, yeah, living and attractive. Paul tells us in the passage. He describes the God we pray to. This is good and pleases God, our Savior. Pray to the one, the only one who has the power to save you, the Savior, the one who is going to, uh, to come alongside you and lift you up through mercy and grace from where you are. That's the God we pray to, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Pray to God, the Savior. It's a critical concept of who we think of in terms of who God is. He's not just a creator. He's not just an ethereal force. He's not just, uh, as some uh, philosophies believe, just uh, as somebody who put the um, universe into operation and then left it to its own devices. No. God is integrally involved in His creation and wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants you to know Him intimately. That's what He means by Savior. It's not about getting out of hell. 
It's about getting close to God. I would have thought that would have got an amen. We pray to God who can save us. That's what Paul wants to highlight here, that all people would be saved. So yes, Timothy, the church in which you're in, which is fighting and arguing about who's in charge and who leads and what role marriage plays, that was what was happening in the Ephesian church. He says, remember that God wants all of your neighbors, all of those people, all of those who are coming to see the temple, Diana, He wants all of those people to be saved. So pray to the God who can save. But more than that, he goes, there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Intriguing that into a city that worshipped multiple gods and goddesses, Paul says there is one God. And what he means is there's one God who's alive. There's one God who's powerful. There's one God who is the creator. That's who we pray to. And that one God also sent a person, the G Jesus Christ, uh, God Himself, to mediate between us and Him, to become a person who can draw us close, to, to bring the two parties who are at odds with each other together. God did that. So we pray to God, the mediator, the one God who can bring us together. But more than that, we pray to God, the Redeemer, who ransomed us. The word ransom means he paid a price to free us. He ransomed us, brought us close. He redeemed us, bought us back. The word redeem is an economical term, not a theological term. It means to buy back. You, you know the term, right? How many of you have redeemed vouchers? So a voucher is essentially a promise. If you give this voucher you get whatever the voucher says, right? Well, Jesus is the voucher that says, all of your sins not held against you. The barriers between you and God not held against you. You can come close. That's the work. That's who we pray to. And he didn't just pay a ransom for some people. His ransom is large enough for every person, including that person. Now stop thinking about them. Think about yourself. <laughs> So we pray to God, our Savior. We pray to the one God. We pray to the God, the mediator. We pray to God, the redeemer. And then there's one last thing that the Bible would want us to know about this God we pray to. If that's all true in 1 Timothy, what we pray to is the God who is sovereign. We've lost sight of this word, I think, sometimes by talking about how loving God is. We forget that He's also sovereign. He's above everything. He's in charge. He's in control. And the Bible, from Old Testament through all the books to the New Testament, describe a God who is over everything. Here's just a few verses. Proverbs 21.1, from the wisest man who ever will live, Solomon, he says, the king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. He guides it wherever he pleases. Doesn't matter who, who wins the election, Whoever sits in uh, office uh, of the president for America, they don't get to decide what happens. God does. God directs kings wherever he pleases. Even when they try to do evil, God works in it to do what he wants to accomplish. It's what we believe as Christians. God is in charge, and He influences world leaders continually a, a, along His purpose. It, it blows my mind that we think somebody who created stars and galaxies can't control a person in charge of a country. <laughs> now, He doesn't control them like a robot puppeteer. What He does is God has a plan, and He has a purpose, and He sees the decisions that are going to be made, and He works in and through those to accomplish His purposes. We don't sometimes like the results of that, but that's how God works. He's sovereign. I love this passage. This is Jesus talking to Pilate, and Pilate, kind of leading up to this sentence, kind of says to Jesus, do you know who I am? <laughs> you know the power I have to control your life? And Jesus looks at him. It's one of the few times Jesus speaks to Pilate. And this is what he says. You would have no power over me at all unless it were given you from above. 
Jesus, who is about to be put to death by crucifixion, by the authority and decision of Pilate, says to Pilate, you can't make that decision if my father didn't choose that for you. God is sovereign. No matter what happens in the election, no matter what happens in the days that following, God is sovereign. Daniel is a book written about a man in exile, taken to Babylon, who is put into the king's courts and put into compromising positions where his faith is challenged and questioned. And when he stands up against that and resists it, he says the following prayer. Praise the name of God forever and ever, for He has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. Daniel, caught in uh, horrific situations with, a, ki- with a, 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 a ruler of the Babylonian Empire who wants to kill him, who wants to make him worship him, who wants to do all sorts of manner, says, it is God who directs the course of world events. God is sovereign. He controls time, He controls seasons, and He controls leaders. God is sovereign. That's who we pray to. We need to remind ourselves, I think, church, that we don't just worship a person who is a figment of our imagination. We worship a God who is alive, who is powerful, who is the Creator, who can redeem us, who is our Savior, and who is sovereign over everything. So who do we pray for? All people, including our leaders. Who do we pray to? The God who is in control of everything. And what do we pray? Well, Paul uses four words for prayer in verse 1 of Timothy. Petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. The word petitions means a cry for help. To go and request, I am desperate, I have need. It's a petition you would take to a king. Is using an interesting word that is a formal declaration you would make to a king. He's saying you make that to God. Bring your cries of help to God. What concerns you about the election? Bring those to God in prayer as a cry for help. What do you worry about? Bring that to God in a cry for help. Bring your petitions And then he uses the word prayers, but the Greek word for prayers here means specifically only those thoughts directed towards God, not towards some sort of idol. It's a general word for prayer, but the, the subject of prayer is God. And he says, you want to bring your petitions and pray to God. And then he uses this word intercessions, which is a fabulous word. It means to appeal to God on behalf of someone And it is sometimes viewed as praying against something. This word is used when Elijah, uh, when Paul writes in Romans 11, 2 about Elijah praying against Israel because of Israel's evil. It's this same word of intercession. Do you know that you can pray against what is happening and lift that up to God? Because prayer is the first, last, best resource you have. During the apartheid government of South Africa, Reverend Desmond Tutu prayed against the South African government using this word as his basis. He would pray and intercede for the apartheid government to fall down because of its evil, but he was lifting up his, uh, the, the authorities to God. He was following what Paul says in Timothy. So yes, You can pray for help. You can pray to God for what is happening. But you can also intercede for the nation. And then maybe the hard word is the last one. That in the end, we give thanks to God for the opportunities we have, for the people we're praying for, including our leaders, and for the place and time in which we live. That's a hard one. What if your presidential candidate doesn't win? Could you pray with thanksgiving for the one who is there? That's what Paul says. That's what God's word says. That's the instruction to us. 
to pray with petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving. It's Paul's way of kind of saying the following, uh, that we pray all types for all people. So what do we pray? What can we pray about? What are some of the specifics? Well, we can pray for salvation, right? We can pray for the salvation of people around us, the people on our streets, the people in our towns, the people in our country, the people with whom our country negotiates and interacts with. We can pray for salvation. According to Proverbs 21, you can pray for the influence God has on leaders, that they would submit to that influence, that they would follow that influence, that they wouldn't resist the influence of God. We can pray for influence. According to Daniel, we could pray for wisdom for our leaders so that they would discern the movement of God and the way He's moving in the world and instead follow God. Because really you have two choices as a leader. You can find out what God's will is and follow it, or three choices. You can find out God's will and follow it. You can find out God's will and ignore it, or you could just not find out God's will. But either way, God's will is going to happen. So you can pray for our leaders to be discerning and have wise leaders around them and, and have receptive and listening ears. And Jeremiah says the most amazing thing. How many of you know Jeremiah 29, 11? It's the verse that says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper. So this verse comes a few verses before that. Now, that verse, Jeremiah 29, is written by Jeremiah while he is in exile in Babylon. So uh, the people have been separated away. Jerusalem has been conquered. Israel no longer exists as a nation. The Babylonian Empire controls it all. And people have been shipped off because that's how the Babylonians work. They would conquer you and they'd take the citizens and then they would spread them out all over the Roman Empire so you could no longer come together and, and uh, resist or protest or or fight back. So these exiles have been spread all over the Babylonian Empire. And here's what Jeremiah says to the people in exile is the word of God and what they should pray for. He says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Consider that for a moment. The Israelite nation who were held in uh, as a central belief that the nation of Israel and the king of Israel was God's means of bringing them close and saving them, that had been uh, stripped away and disappeared. And then God says, you know what I want you to pray for? The success of those who oppress you. Okay, maybe not God. But that's what Jeremiah says. Pray for the city in which you are, for its peace and its prosperity. And if it prospers, you too will prosper. That word peace is the all-encompassing word shalom. We are to pray for the shalom of Framingham, Uxbridge, Hopkinton, Ashland, Natick, if I've missed your town, I apologize, the Metro West, Massachusetts, America. And then, of course, the rest of the world. But we are called to pray for this to prosper because if it prospers, we prosper. And the gospel goes forward is the whole point. So what do we pray? This is from a different commentary by William Mounts, the word biblical commentary. The point is that all prayers of all types should be for all people. Pray, 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 pray. That is what we are to do. I love the message translation of Timothy 1. The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know, uh, every way you know how for everyone you know. Pretty all-encompassing, right? So before you jump on social media, before I jump on social media, before we text that person, before we rant and rave, usually in my own home throwing things at the TV, before we engage in that, Pray, every way you know, for everyone you know. 